Hello everyone, my name is Oscar Elbrecht and today I'm going to present some results from the SCAN DNA Net project. The whole thing started a few years ago where we had from Christian Meissner 18 macroinvertebrate samples and tested if we can get the same results with DNA meta barcoding compared to morphological identifications. And the good news is that worked really well, so we decided we should scale this up with everybody from the Nordic countries and this thankfully was funded by the Nordic Council of Ministers. And basically we wanted to see if we can scale this to hundreds of samples and really move macroinvertebrate monitoring from morphology, maybe at some point to DNA-based methods. Here is an overview of the people behind this project. Christian Meissner is the project leader, but there were a lot of people involved in sampling and organizing the sampling, especially also the identification of the different specimens. Because those are official monitoring samples from the government, that means a lot of care was taken to identify those specimens by taxonomic experts. For the lab work, for the DNA meta barcoding, we also had quite an international team, and I just played a small role in doing the bioinformatics. Overall, we had 304 samples, and you can see the distribution of samples here. We used a pretty standard meta barcoding workflow, working in plates rather than individual samples to keep things efficient. One important aspect of our workflow is that we extracted DNA in triplicates and also processed and sequenced each of those replicates so that if something goes wrong, we can detect it. Here is also the bioinformatic workflow, which basically relies on denoising followed by OGU clustering with very stringent quality filtering before and after. Unfortunately, throughout the whole laboratory and bioinformatic process, we did encounter some roadblocks and issues, which I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. If you want to have a look at the details, you have three more seconds to take a screenshot. The first issue we encountered was with DNA quality. A few samples did not show any DNA in the gel or did show degraded DNA. This is likely not caused by the denatured ethanol, as most samples work just fine. We assume that this problem is in sample handling, so the instructions were to replace the ethanol with fresh ethanol a few hours after collecting the samples to ensure that the overall ethanol percentage is higher than 90%. So we can see here that for example for Denmark, there were a bit more samples affected which had no DNA visible in the gels or degraded DNA. Here we recommend that there is some better training for the field crews in sample collection. Also next time we will include extraction positive controls in the extraction plates. We also recommend to check the DNA quality using digital methods because running gels can be a little bit inconsistent sometimes. But overall we can see that the majority of the samples did have good DNA quality. When looking at the meta barcoding data we realized there was another issue. Some of the replicates in plate 1 were not consistent. You can see here replicate A is quite different from replicate B or C. If you take a closer look at the samples affected, it looks like as if in the Excel sheet two rows were switched. However, also some other samples were affected which could not be resolved. Fortunately, only 14 wells of over a thousand were affected by these issues. However, ideally this should be at 0%. We don't want to have these sample swapping issues. So better procedures should definitely be implemented. There should be more standardized workflows in quality insurance and quality control. I think one thing that can really help with this is to have a digital system in the background. So using a laboratory information management system. From here on out, the lab work was completed without any further issues and we were excited to get some sequencing data back. However, the worst possible thing happened. The sequencing run completely failed. We had an issue with dimers, so 95% of the reads, the sequences in the run were dimers, which you can see here in the histogram. So the length of the DNA fragments is very, very short, 
And we usually would expect over 90% of your sequences to be in this area here. But this certainly was not the case, which completely messed up our sequencing run. So that's $8,000 down the drain. And at that point, we were not really sure what was going on, because if we take a look at the gel images, normally if you have dimers, you would see some, some shadow bands down here. But our images look pretty clean. So these areas here are, are empty as they should be. So long story short, even so we repeated the cleanup and the library sequencing, we could not get any useful data out of this. So at that point, we start to panic a little bit because with traditional assessment with morphology, you would always have the animals, you know, the voucher specimens to go back to. And if there is some mistake, have them re-identified. But we ground all of those specimens up. The only thing we could do at that point is to basically repeat the whole lab processing steps. So we did go back to the extracted DNA and did run all of this in a different lab. So this was done in Florian Laser's lab by Dominic Büchner. He spent like a week to just push all of those 11 plates through a high throughput liquid handling robot and basically saved the day and that library just worked fine. So the lesson learned here is that keeping the DNA is very, very important. Even if you have a good laboratory workflow, there's always some room for error and issues. But as long as you have good quality DNA, you can always fall back to the DNA. So the DNA is kind of our, our word voucher specimen of DNA metabarcoding in a sense. Now as the sequencing worked, we did end up with quite a lot of sequences that have to be processed. And usually there's not too much of an issue if you have enough computational resources. However, I only had a MacBook available for data analysis, which means analyzing the data can take a week or something like that. So to get around that bottleneck, I think it's really important to work in a cloud or some server-based solution can be a local server. This way, there's enough computational power and things are scalable as the metabarcoding data grows with time. Speaking of getting a hold of the data, there were unfortunately a few hiccups as well. First of all, the sequencing provider did send the data on a hard drive, which is not super efficient. Also, the data was corrupted, so a few of those files actually did not contain the right formatted data we requested. And also, the provider did ignore our instructions on how to run the Illumina machine specifically. So here I recommend that it's good to have a sequencing provider where you can build a long-term relationship with them so they know what kind of data you expect to get back from them and how to deliver that data to you in an efficient manner. Even though we had these issues, I still think it's more cost efficient to send away things for sequencing to an external sequencing provider in most cases, especially because the sequencing space is so fast moving when new machines come to market every year you don't want to buy a machine that's outdated after a few years that costs you a lot of money. The last challenge on the bioinformatics side is doing the taxonomic assignment, figuring out the species behind all the sequences we obtain with metabarcoding. And the challenge here is that there are several reference databases. So NCBI and BOLD are really popular ones, but also a lot of data is still sitting at the institutions. And a lot of data is also still private. So even data on BOLD is private, it can't be verified. So if there are gaps in the reference database or records in the reference database are inaccurate, it's very difficult to verify and resolve these issues because so much data is still not available or the metadata with the reference data is not available. So I can't figure out what is really going on with records that might indicate that there is an issue, like a misidentified species, for example. So here I would like to pitch that this is a huge chance for the Nordic countries to actually create a community-driven open source reference database for macroinvertebrates for the Nordic countries. So purpose-driven for monitoring of macroinvertebrates. This would mean that all the local experts and taxonomists and ecologists can sit down together and verify records because if it's open source, everybody can view things and flag things that might be incorrect. And also we get a better idea of what's actually still missing in the reference database, right? And this can lead to an effort to collect the last few missing species and actually close those gaps in the reference database.
Also, the private data some people still have could be published with this reference database really makes this a team effort and bring the macroinvertebrate monitoring in the Nordic countries to the next level using DNA meta barcoding. So if you're interested in this, reach out to me and maybe we get a critical mass together of people who want to push this forward. Despite all of these challenges and really thanks to the effort of everybody in the team, we got really nice data out of this study regardless. So we can see here the amount of tags that are detected with DNA meta barcoding plotted against the amount of tags that are detected per sample with morphology. And you can see that there's a pretty good relationship. So we basically get the same amount of taxa or in many cases, even more tags are detected with the DNA based message. So this is really promising, but we really need to sit down and focus on still improving the methods and especially improving the scaling of this DNA based method. So what are the next steps? I think it's really important to make sure the sampling is done in a DNA friendly way. Also, the protocols certainly have to be further refined and improved. And the IT infrastructure should be built out as well as the reference databases. Also, there needs to be some standards to facilitate the uptake of these methods. And Christian Meissner is actually chairing a commission right now, working on exactly that with many of the DNA Aquanet community as well. And of course, there should be constant communication with stakeholders to make sure whatever we are building here is actually useful for them and can be applied, meet their needs for the monitoring of macroinvertebrates. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you're interested in learning more about this project, the whole report is actually online and you can scan the QR code on the screen to get a copy of the report.